I know, I know, I know, I know. But my, my bad. My bad. I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. My bad. Metro and his bitch going brave. I know my Sorcerer Supreme editing skills make it seem like last year was jam-packed full of amazing releases, but uh, it was actually quite the opposite. Because when looking back at the releases of last year, most of them were complete fucking dog shit. Hitman 3 came out towards the end of January and kept true to its previous entries, which was great, don't get me wrong. I mean, in what other game are you allowed to wear a clown costume while forcing respawn on a bunch of people at a funeral? So, you know, based on that, things weren't looking too bad. But after that, the gaming industry kind of just dived head first into complete disappointment and this was before all the male blizzard employees were outed for forcing their female co-workers to human centipede with them this was due to the games that release not the you know sexual assault going on in the workplace of the game companies after hitman there was little nightmares not a bad game but horror puzzle and platformers all happened to be my least favorite genres so i passed then there was Bowser's Fury. Mario's kind of the king of platformers and considering my distaste for the genre, yeah. I actually played Persona 5 Strikers, but since the story completely excluded the high school element of the first one, I dropped it. Um, let's see, what else was there? Oh, there was the totally deserved and not at all complete bullshit game of the year, It Takes Two. This one wasn't actually too bad. And although I enjoyed the make- Let's see, what was there in April? Ah, oh, here we go. Near Replicant version 1.2247. New Pokemon Snap, available April 3rd. Man, get this whack ass shit out of here, nigga. 448713. Resident Evil was actually really good, but you know, scary game and all. I refused to play it after the dead fetus started chasing me down the fucking hallways. 9727-3547. But finally, the year-long handjob would end and turn into a full-blown blowjob when Mass Effect Legendary Edition released. It only took four months, but there was finally another game worth playing. But the craziest thing about this being the second good game to release after five months into the year is that these games originally released in 2007, 2010, and 2012. Which means that technically, they're not really new games, but just kind of re releases so we shouldn't count those but you know i'll give i'll give them the benefit of the doubt and count it anyways and even if i included resident evil it came out the same month as mass effect so it would still be the whole four months before the good release but after that it kind of just went back to the shitty releases so i just uh went back and started playing and replaying older games because the new ones were just complete fucking dog shit and i i couldn't i couldn't they're so bad and although this year in gaming was overall pretty fucking flaccid, next year is going to be a full blood flowing erection. But enough about these shitty ass 2021 games, let's talk about what was actually good. The stuff that kept me entertained when the new game squandered their chance to do so was shit like Planet Zoo, which had me trying to build the best animal prison possible, breed those animals, and then sell them to the highest bidder. You also have the option to release to the wild, but I'm not a fucking vegan. I don't care about these animals, bro. They're attractions to make money for me. Fuck them niggas. I spent a lot of time playing Tetris when laying down, which convinced me that I was destined for the pro circuit, but uh, you know, after watching those niggas play, I kind of gave up on that dream. Me and Morgan played a lot of Smash Ultimate, which led to a lot of, uh, let's call them disagreements, but watching the pros had me thinking the exact opposite as Tetris. I still wholeheartedly believe I can become the best cloud in a... There was this rhythm game, no, not that one, called Fuser, which is probably the best rhythm game ever made, but uh, it kind of has a $200 price point for all the songs, and considering, you know, I work at Wendy's for minimum wage, I can't really afford a $200 game, especially if it doesn't come with an action figure, so I had to refund it. I ended up becoming pretty fascinated with vineyards this year, so in order to get the authentic experience, I of course played a simulator. I also visited one in real life, but uh, what's real life to a video game? I mean, come on. 
Really good game though. What else was there? Oh, disappoints me so much to say this, but I also picked up League. That was like interacting with a serotonin succubus. So I only have one piece of advice after my short time in the jungle as a Yi one trick. <clears throat> Never play League of Legends. And although these games kept their end of the bargain after I paid them for their services, they weren't exactly the best games I had played this year. They were good, yes, but they weren't. Fuck, if Keanu Reeves had a cameo, he would make the perfect fit for this part of the video. They'd probably be really expensive though, so I probably wouldn't even be able to afford it. Jurston's Top Games of 2021. Normally I don't replay games, but since every game releasing last year was as interesting as a smelly gooch, I was kind of forced to go back and retry some. So I decided to play the Witcher series again. Not the whole thing, but the second and third one. I also tried replaying the first one, but that shit's way too outdated to enjoy. So it kind of just acted like it didn't exist. And in all honesty, I only replayed the second one because there's a tattoo, tattoo that Geralt can get, which carries over to the third one. And it was extremely important that I had it. It added literally nothing to the overall experience, but I found it to be the most pivotal piece of the game nonetheless. And even without the tattoo, The Witcher 3 is pretty fucking good. Although the main narrative doesn't rival that of Red Dead 2 or God of War, it's still one of the most complete games I've ever played. The characters that surround the main story and the people you meet throughout the side quests are so fleshed out that you make real connections and care about them. Where most open worlds are just big empty husks with no real life to them, The Witcher's the complete opposite. And not the complete opposite, but it has more shit in it than these loose assholes. No matter where you go, there's something going on. Bring out the gimp. From the bustling parties in town after the sun sets to a village full of humans that have been turned to pigs due to their own greed. It all comes together to create a real breathing world. And just because the narrative isn't as good as Red Dead's doesn't mean it's not great in its own way. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. The next part has spoilers. Um, just uh, skip to this time if you don't want to be spoiled. I'll give you guys a couple seconds. All right, y'all niggas are probably gone now. All right, here we go. There's actually a moment in the main quest that made me tear up both times I witnessed it because of just how well the anticipation of that moment is built up from the beginning of the game. The score that surrounds this moment fills your soul with its insatiable sadness. You play this gruff, nearly unemotional main character and somehow, in this moment, without a single line of dialogue, the writers are able to instill one of the most heart-tugging moments of any game I've ever played. The only thing keeping The Witcher from being higher on this list is the fact that I didn't get to replay the Blood and Wine DLC, which is actually better than Red Dead and God of War's narrative. Where the main story is about finding Geralt's daughter Ciri and protecting her from the Wild Hunt, the Blood and Wine DLC is actually about Geralt. It's his story this time around, the end of his story in fact, and the storylines that this full game size DLC adds are some of the most unforgettable ever. But we're gonna forget about them anyways because the only thing that really matters that comes with this DLC is the fact that you get to own a vineyard, bro. You remember fucking five minutes ago when I was talking about how upset? Yeah, nigga, you get one of those. Shit's fucking crazy. That's that's why this is number six. Not because of the story. Not because of all that other series. It's the it's the vineyard. It's only the vineyard. You know, the craziest thing about Forza being on this list is that one, I don't really like racing games and two, I don't even like cars, but that just goes to show just how much of a masterpiece Forza Horizon is. And I mean the fourth and fifth one. I haven't played anything before that because I was poor growing up. I'm technically, I'm still poor. I'm just a little less poor. Regardless of what I wanted to do, this series had it though. If I wanted to just drive around really fast in the most realistic environment ever, I could do that. If I wanted to pit my McLaren and Senna against every other luxury sports car and utterly destroy them with my fully maxed out kit and superior racing skills that put every NASCAR and F1 driver to shame, I could do that. If I wanted to lose to a fucking train, I could also do that. There's really no limit to what you can do in this masterclass racing sim, except control the direction of your car midair, which, you know, I think it's probably something that you should implement into your game. But besides that, there's literally no other racing game that comes close to the perfect balance of casual and competitive play that Forza has.
for some people, Grim Fandango and Monkey Island is the first time they've experienced a point and click game that's completely reliant on its story. These two games were pivotal to the genre's rise in popularity and allowed the focus of a game's narrative to become just as important or even more important than its gameplay. The next game to further this idea and shoot these games to the mainstream was Telltale's The Walking Dead. Regarded as one of the greatest narrative experiences of all time, it perfected the point and click genre because whenever you try to talk shit about its lack of gameplay, people tend to get pretty upset and they do this because of how good the story is. The Walking Dead further developed the idea that people could appreciate a game with little to no gameplay if the story was moving okay. enough. And as underappreciated as it is, I still hold out hope that 12 minutes will become this generation's The Walking Dead. With one of the most intriguing narratives I've ever come across, it explores the complexities of the human mind and one's reluctance to give up what they can't have and showcases how far they're willing to go in order to hold on to what's dear to them. You play as an unnamed male character, voiced by James fucking McAvoy, whose marriage begins to fall apart after it's revealed that your wife, voiced by Rey from those shitty Star Wars movies, killed her father. And the person who brings all this to light is a police officer voiced by the fucking green goblin himself willem dafoe well, it's up to you Mark? to figure out the whole truth save your wife and save yeah, your unborn baby. child but is it even possible it throws you into this horrific experience and forces you to go through it again and again loop after loop until you find the answers you seek and if you happen to get hurt in any way you have to start all the way over but when you finally get to those answers it's not at all what you had hoped it'd be in fact it makes you want to forget again it makes you want to go back to the beginning and leave all those buried skeletons in the closet. I don't really like mystery games, but this one was so much more than that. It is truly one of the best stories I've ever ingested, and the emotional reaction that it caused in me is one of the strongest ever. It's only six hours, and it's free on Xbox Game Pass. Go play 12 minutes, but don't you dare fucking leave this video to go and play. You better finish this shit. I need the audience retention so I can get recommended, so I can get rich so I don't have to work at fucking Wendy's anymore. Due to the catastrophic disaster that was their Avengers game, most people just ignored the idea of the Square Enix produced Guardians of the Galaxy one. And for good fucking reason too, because the Avenger game was absolutely a Appalling. So when I heard they were releasing another superhero game, I was flabbergasted. They had just released one of the worst multiplayer games of all time, one that lost them millions of dollars, and they were gonna do it again? The fucking cojones on these niggas, bro. At this point, I began to think there was some Edward Snowden shit going on, because Square Enix was clearly trying to cut ties with Marvel in the most ruthless way possible to secure a deal with DC. But then the game released. And no one could have imagined what happened. The game turns out fucking amazing, bro. It had the music, the gameplay, the story, the characters, the dialogue, a fucking dragon, a space alpaca, everything. Square Enix single-handedly redeemed themselves with this one. And as long as they completely erase the events of the Avengers game, I can't wait to see what they do with their Marvel Universe next. You know, maybe we'll even get a, a, um, a Hawkeye game. That's something everybody wants, right? The first time I came across a Mass Effect game, I was in either 4th or 5th grade. My mom took me to a GameStop and sat there in the ever so glorious BOGO bin for a mere $15 was Mass Effect 3. I say mere, but at the time $15 was like fucking $1500 for me. And after questioning the nigga who worked there extensively to make sure I wasn't wasting my beloved $15, I bought it. I took it home, loaded it up on my Xbox 360, and got to customizing my Commander Shepard. After that, I jumped into the game, and immediately, I was pulled in by this beautiful fucking soundtrack. I mean, listen to this shit. Dun, dun, dun. 
From there, I began grinding away at it, and even though I hadn't played the first couple games, I was instantly invested. Keep in mind, this was the same year that I started masturbating, so this game managed to keep a hornier version of myself entertained for hours. Eventually I realized I was missing so much of the story, two whole games. So I stopped around the Geth and Quarian War and waited until I could buy the first two. It actually wouldn't be until my sophomore year of high school in 2017 that I committed to beating the Mass Effect trilogy. That summer, every day for about a week, I would wake up, turn on my shitty ass $200 laptop, and throw myself into this new universe full of aliens, space travel, and a little bit of sexual intercourse. So when the Legendary Edition released last year, I did the same thing I did in 2017. Every day for a week straight, I'd wake up and immediately throw myself into this war-torn universe. And it was everything I had remembered it to be. With the most memorable and realistic characters ever written, it was amazing to see these crew members again. My favorite aspect of any game is being able to talk to the characters you call your friends, and Mass Effect is the game that does this the best. From getting your adopted alien son out of jail to doing 183 pull-ups with this buff ass nigga, every interaction with these characters leaves a lasting impression. Seeing the growth in characters from the first game to the last one is something I completely overlooked during my initial playthrough. Everyone looks to you for guidance in the first one. Tally is leaving her home for the first time, trying to figure out why she's important to her people. Liara is an introverted scientist whose longest conversations have been to ancient fossils about ancient fossils. Garrus is a space cop with no power to do the right thing who looks up to you as if you're his big brother. Rex is, um, well, he's Rex. He kind of doesn't change throughout the whole thing. And Ashley, she actually, she's kind of racist, God. so I just chose the most disrespectful dialogue choices every time I interacted with her. Kaden's a sweetheart, though. Love that nigga. If I had to be gay, it I wouldn't am be not for gay. him. But second, he comes gay. second. And this is just the start. In the second game, you unintentionally break off from them. You get a new crew, one that's a bit more experienced than your last one. They aren't as open to the idea of you leading as your former crew, but after some beloved companion quest, they come around, which leads to you caring for them, not Samara, just as much as you cared for your former crew, not Samara though. And to make matters even better, you eventually get two of the people from your old crew back, and it's practically like old times. Then to make it even juicier, you see the rest of the crew members that you had the first time around and for the most part they're all doing good they took the guidance you gave them and became their own people the literal definition of complex characters and in the third game when the time comes for the original crew to get back together there's practically no hesitation to do so except that like two of them are in the middle of wars to avoid extinction of their entire species but that's a small speed bump in the grand scheme of universal doom you know what i mean honestly i could talk about this game for hours i actually planned on making an entire review of the legendary edition but it was shaping up to be a couple hours long so i kind of had to scrap it but mass effect isn't carried solely by its characters the main story is one of pure genius your commander shepherd sometimes referred to as space jesus and it's your job to bring the entire universe together to fight a threat that no one believes exists each game the stakes are upped more and more the disaster that can be brought on by your failure increases and you and your crew are alone the government doesn't care to help you until it's too late the fate of the universe rests on your shoulders and your shoulders alone and then everything you worked for since the first game comes to this massive crescendo in the third one the war you are in the center of comes to a head and the battle between shepherd and the reapers ends and although you had many friends to get you to the climax <laughs> only you have the power to decide what must be done it's one of the greatest stories told in the gaming medium that has something for everyone whether it be action romance or you know an abusive main character if that's the route you want to go mass effect is truly the greatest game series of all time When looking back at this list, which I would like to add is the only factually based best games of the year list out there, there's a couple similarities between pretty much every game. I've beaten The, the Witcher 3, hey, 12 hey. Minutes, and Mass Effect twice. I play Forza a few times every week, and I beat Guardians of the Galaxy a little over a month ago. 
You guys seeing the trend? My experiences with these games is relatively fresh, or they're drilled into my memory because of how many times I've played them. But this one here, this last one, the critically acclaimed Jerston's best game of the year, is something I've only beaten once, and that my most recent experience with is over half a year ago. And even though there's been so much time since then, it's left the most lasting impression of any game I've ever played. You start on a black screen, a rising ominous song begins to play, then you hear a voice. There is nothing. In a malicious tone, the voice starts spouting these overly depressing anecdotes. The exposition is long with a lot of big words that the I had to look up in order song. to fully understand, but once I found out the definitions of those words, the you loneliness like they instilled was like so that. real. Yeah, nigga, see, I switched my cadence from like, ah, to like, ah, uh, like, that shit was crazy. Yeah, nigga, I'm a voice actor. After getting bombarded with self-hatred by the voices in your head, you finally get to see something. But the sight that beholds you confirms all the depressing shit the voices were saying. When I think about Red Dead 2, God of War, and pretty much every other extremely compelling narrative experience, it's easy to deduce the core themes behind their stories. It might sound crazy, and I bet most of you didn't know this, or maybe some, nah, there's no way you know this, but Red Dead, Red Dead is a story of redemption. <laughs> pretty fucking crazy, am I right? Shit, that shit got caught you on guard, didn't it? God of War is a story of fatherhood. These games take simple concepts and turn them into semi-complex stories, but Disco Elysium is so much more than every other narrative I've come across. The level of complexity to this game far exceeds any game, movie, or TV show I've ever ingested. I would even go as far as to consider some games art. And I know the idea of games being art is kinda wacky. But when done well, games are some of the most polished pieces of art ever conceived. But every game that aspires to become a work of art pales in comparison to the abstract and dense masterpiece that is Disco Elysium. And I don't just mean its narrative, I mean every single aspect of this game is a pure and perfected work of art. You play a cop trying to solve a murder case. Sounds easy enough. But on top of that, you don't know who you are. You can't even remember your name. But Just due to the, the voices in your head, you do remember one thing. You're a crippling fucking alcoholic. And it just so happens that the area in which you're investigating in is on the edge of war with the leading country that you come from. So to the people of this island, you're an invader sent here to fuck up their way of life, which leads to them not being the most helpful in cracking the case. And on top of that, whoever you were before you lost your identity was kind of a piece of shit. Because in your drunken rage, you kind of embarrassed yourself in front of all the locals, either through violence, threats, or karaoke. And this is just the first 45 minutes of the game. Everything in this game matters. From the most annoying interaction with the ginger kid that won't stop calling you racial and homophobic slurs, to your conversations with a paraplegic woman who has a bug obsession. All these small interactions are crucial to the outcome of the world you inhabit, crucial to you rediscovering your identity, and crucial to you cracking this case. The craziest thing about my enjoyment of this game was that I actually almost gave up playing it after the first four hours. In that short time, there was so much story thrown at me that it was a little hard to follow. Along with that, it's also a point and click game. It definitely has more elements than your average point and click, but it's still part of a rather dull hey, genre. Hey, hey. With a mix of confusion and boredom, I ran into Morgan about it not being good told her that it wasn't the game for me, but thankfully, you I had literally life? nothing else to play at this. the time, so I force fed myself a couple more hours. It continued to go a little slow, with long expositions about the world and characters around you, and although it's completely necessary to grasp the situation that you're in, it does come off a bit underwhelming. But then the game starts to gradually speed up, and build more momentum, and more momentum, until it's at a full caution to the wind, neck-breaking speed, and that's when the game really gets 
started, a dead body starts talking to you. You do karate moves with your partner. You sing karaoke. You can become a rock star conspiracy theorist cop disillusioned by reality. You can become a Nazi cop. You can turn a church into a dance club. You unlock a freezer. I don't remember what you get for unlocking that freezer, but I do remember it being important. It all just comes together and creates the most masterly crafted narrative of all time. It tackles the idea of heartbreak and just how far someone is willing to go in order to get away from it. It shows you what it feels like to have depressive thoughts that Maybe relentlessly that beat down on you, but it allows you to fight those thoughts and be better. It shows you that you're really the only one in charge of your life. It's a sad story in a sad world, but somehow it managed to maintain a comical undertone. If you want to remain a drunken failure of a cop, you can. If you aspire to be as great as you once were, you can. The choice is yours. Everything that happens in the game is up to you. Every outcome is determined by your choices. You're in a world that truly doesn't move unless you allow it to. So why haven't you gotten moving yet?